In November of 1980, I was in charge of keeping the United States Air Force happy. I did this by folding my underwear precisely six inches by six inches. Not five and three quarters, not six and one quarter, but six U.S. government regulation, clean, dry, and serviceable inches. I toyed briefly with the notion of folding one side to 15.24 centimeters, because I'm a wild child like that. But I chickened out because in basic training, when the Air Force is not happy, they send a guy over to you to explain exactly how not happy they are. And he was really good at that. He was very passionate. It's like it was his only job. Well, in order to defend our nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic, the Air Force doesn't really need my underwear in little six-inch squares. What it needs is for me to understand that I'm not in charge of my underwear. They are. See, their mission is to defend our country. And everything else is a distant secondary consideration, including my opinion about how underwear should be folded. Turns out that's the entire purpose of basic training, is to restructure the list of priorities in a trainee's mind in such a way that the Air Force is on the very top. There are other functions like fitness and learning the rules and that crazy thing they do with initials. But the overall function of basic training is to get that list of priorities shuffled the way they want it. And I was very fortunate because when I joined, my father had already been in the Air Force as a career person, and the concept of having my priorities reshuffled happened on a regular basis. My brother and I were not permitted problems as children. There were only challenges and opportunities. A problem, by his definition, was something you dumped on your boss's desk when you quit thinking. A challenge might require your boss's input, but you were still part of that solution. You were still part of the process and making a contribution. And I remember the day this was indelibly imprinted upon my young soul. I was trying to start a lawnmower in advance of a base-wide inspection, and I'm outside in the heat, pulling on that stupid rope like the fate of the universe was in my nine-year-old hands. I'm sweating, I'm honking, I'm pulling on that thing, and yeah, I might have uttered some big boy words, I don't know. But I had to come in and tell him, Dad, the lawnmower won't start. Sorry, I can't help you. He didn't even look up from his ball game. He said, there's some scissors in the drawer in there. Whoa. <laughs> now, my dad was a funny guy, but I always knew when he was not kidding. And he was not kidding. I was going to get the grass cut. It was going to happen. Failing that inspection meant that he was going to be in front of his commander explaining why grass was just too difficult a challenge for us to manage. And woe be unto the behind of the young man that created that opportunity. So the fate of the entire universe was not in my hands, but there was one small section of it I was very concerned about. So I went outside and I reevaluated this lawnmower situation. I came back in. I said, Dad, can you give me a ride to the gas station? 180 degree difference. He already had his shoes on. Keys were ready. He was just waiting for me to ask the right question. And yes, on the way to the station, we did discuss language choices and word usage. But the civilian community doesn't have the equivalent of basic training. The need for the employer to come first, or at least pretty high on the list of priorities, is still there. But unless a young person, like yourselves, not like anybody that's not here, but unless a young person has somebody or an event in their lives to teach them what we now quaintly refer to as old-fashioned values, the idea of notching their agenda down a couple of places so that something else can go on top is kind of silly. I was at the Governor's Forum for Small Business, and I was speaking with the owner of a manufacturing plant. He said that he was consistently asked by technical schools what kind of welding they should teach so that their students were better prepared. He said, I can teach them to weld. I need someone to teach them to show up on time. They're not wear flip-flops to my job site and to act like they give up something or other. I forgot what he said after that. I gave him my dad's phone number, though. <laughs> But we talked for a while about how too many times people would show up to his job and they're willing to trade their time for a paycheck. And it sounds like an equitable deal, but that still leaves them at the very top of the priority pyramid. And a job is just something they kind of have to put up with in order to get what they want, some, some kind of paycheck. And it's as if the universe revolves around their desires and their wants. And you know what? They're right. Right up until that first job, it kind of does. Food, clothing, and shelter is all provided. 
And the high school experience is almost exclusively designed for the benefit of the student. We build the buildings, we pay the teachers, not much, but we give them a little something. And we put gas in the buses, also that they can receive an education. And while that process is going on, there are unprecedented levels of media connectivity. From the moment they wake up and grab those screens until the moment they set them down and go back to sleep, every song, every movie, every video clip had better provide exactly what they're looking for in the first few seconds or they're off to any of a thousand other choices they have in that moment. So yes, you can make the argument that the world does revolve around the young people's desires and their needs and that delayed gratification is at best an acquired taste. I've made it my mission to help them acquire that taste. And the spoonful of sugar that helps that medicine go down is this. The ones that are able to make that transition and to put the employer or the job ahead of themselves just for a little bit, just while they're on the clock, they make themselves rare. And rare is valuable. While their coworkers are unable to put their phones down or they're just putting in just enough effort to keep from getting fired. These superior performers are just getting the job done. They're the ones you can count on to show up no matter what the weather's like and to deal with excellent customer service regardless of how difficult the customers are to deal with. They're the ones who make their boss look good to her boss. Imagine being instrumental in getting your boss promoted. Not only is there a position open directly above you, but you're the obvious choice to fill it. And many times, the difference between the two types of employees is just a matter of expectations, of choosing excellence, deciding that you're going to be the person that makes that sort of thing happen. And that is such a fundamental concept that it goes far beyond just the workplace. I remember in the 1980s, I was trying to quit smoking, and it was the hardest thing I have ever done. I promise you that's saying something. It was very difficult, largely because I failed consistently. Despite my best effort, I failed. Tony Barker does not fail, (laughs) but there it was in my face again and again until I saw this bizarre occurrence. I was in a restaurant, and I saw a man finish his meal, and he didn't light a cigarette. That was weird. You have to remember, this is in the 80s. Smoking was everywhere. We just thought it was foggy all the time. (laughs) And I kept an eye on him in case I missed something, and he picked up a cup of coffee. Still no cigarette. I could not process that. And eventually, I came to the conclusion that he was a non-smoker, and that's what I wanted to be. But I was trying to be an ex-smoker, and I really couldn't do that because I was busy being this person that's in this life-or-death struggle with a fire-breathing tobacco dragon. And it wasn't until that I made that mental transition on my own and decided that I was going to be a non-smoker. I put them down, and I haven't picked up a cigarette since President Reagan was in the White House. Here's another example. I was asked to write some radio scripts for an agency that was addressing road rage, and In one of the scripts, I invited the listener to consider the driver that just cut them off in heavy traffic without using a turn signal. (laughs) Anger is a pretty natural reaction to that, but what you do with it is always your choice. Always, every time. It's not just my opinion. That's science. Next time you get a chance, uh, grease up your Googler and look up general semantics. It is a very fascinating read, but here's the essence of it. If you had some way of knowing that that driver was a young mother rushing her injured child to the hospital in a panic, could you find it in your heart to give that person a break? Of course you can. Now, not every person that's cutting you off in traffic is rushing a child to the hospital. But once you know that you can put a little bit of separation, a little distance between the event and your reaction, you can get a little better at doing that. That becomes who you are. You can do it. Going back to the workplace, that has an advantage if you have an employee that's facing a customer that is losing her mind because she didn't get pickles on her hamburger. If that employee is focused on himself, he's going to get pickles on the burger and get her out the door as quickly as possible because she's the problem. But if you own the company or if you care about the company, you're going to take a little bit of extra time, try to convert that person back into a satisfied customer. What if we got really crazy with this and asked our elected leaders and our political leadership to hold themselves to this standard? We're the greatest country in the world 
We do have some serious challenges that are coming our way, but we can't really even talk about them while our blue guys and our red guys are bashing at each other and going after each other's throat over pickles and turn signals. So whether you're a young person that is about to enter the workplace for the first time or if you're a career politician, please choose excellence. That driver did not intend to attack you personally. And even the great pickle catastrophe of last Thursday was not about you. It might have gotten a little personal, but we have to rise above that. We have to rise above that. And remember that the customer or the citizen is what we're about, what we're here for. So please, for yourself, for your company, for your country. Choose excellence. Let's fold your underwear, get some gas in the lawnmower, and get the job done. Thank you. Thank you very much.